You know, a lot of people are talking about AI. It's a concern. We got climate change. Oh my God, this is the end of the world. Nuclear war. But very few people are talking about actual shortage of food. According to The Economist, in the next 40 years, we will need to produce more food in the next 40 years than we have in the previous 10,000 years combined. And one of the industries that a lot of people are talking about is called vertical farming. Matter of fact, a guy named Elon Musk, his brother Kimball is now a farmer investing into vertical farming. Let's get right into it. By the way, if you get value from this video at the end, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Let's get right into it. You know what's crazy is I'm in Fort Lauderdale right now. We had a big flood, 22 inches of rain in Fort Lauderdale, record breaking. Everybody's talking about it. For a couple days, there is no gas in Miami. Everybody is calling saying, I can't fill up the tank. How am I going to come up to Fort Lauderdale? I got to drive up. People are panicking just because there was no gas for one day in Miami. Gas stations were all sold out, right? So you may be saying, Pat, what's your point there? What would you do if you didn't have food for one day? How about two days? three days. Think about that shortage. What happens when you're at a hotel or your place, the bathroom doesn't work. You can't use the bathroom. There's flooding. What do you think about? That stress goes from something you never think about all of a sudden to something massive, right? That's exactly what the concern is with food shortage. I'll give you a stat here. Food production needs to increase by roughly 70% by 2050 to support the expected 10 billion world population. And that's only 27 years from now. So now let's look at a bunch of different data here and see if this is something we ought to be thinking about. The things we'll look at today is arable land. We'll look at topsoil, freshwater supply. We'll look at benefits of vertical farming solutions, different types, how they do it, cost of it, what different companies are doing today. And then at the end, I want to get your thoughts. If this is something we ought to be concerned about and potentially how big of an industry this is going to be by 2030. Wait till you see the numbers. So let's get right into it. Arable land. Is land capable of being used to grow crops? So now arable land is down 30% since the 1970s. It is expected to drop another 60% from the current number by 2050. So it's already down 30% since the 70s. And it's expected to drop another 60% between now and 2050, 27 years from now. Now, let's look at different regions worldwide. Australia, Canada, US. Look at this number here. This chart. Far left is Australia. Dark blue is 1975. Light blue is 85. That orange color is 95. And then the yellow one is 2005. Australia is down 20% of arable land because we're building more buildings. Canada is down 25%. Russia is down 17%. US is down 32 the benefit of capitalism, we're building a lot of different places, but at the same time, the arable land is going to be cut as well, right? So you got Brazil down 16, India's down 45% because India just is getting into capitalism. Their economy is growing. They got a lot of different things. So why is this a concern if we, ha we have our arable lands that's decreasing at the pace that it is just in 40 years of this chart? Well, the next one is about topsoil. Topsoil is the primary resource for plants to grow and crops to thrive. Each year, an estimate made 24 billion tons of fertile soil are lost due to erosion, which is 25% of the total land area has been degraded. So when you look at this map here, you see what it's looking like. Very degraded soil, degraded soil, stable soil, and without vegetation. These are some things that people are sitting there thinking, saying, we may not be worried about it today, but this could be a big issue for us within the next 27 years. And this leads to water, because we also need water. Fresh water supply. Agriculture currently uses roughly 70% of the global fresh water supply. Irrigation, in other words. Only 1-3% to of water on Earth is fresh water. Pesticides and fertilizers and other toxic from chemicals can poison fresh water. So if you look at this here, where is the water on Earth? You'll see 97.2% is oceans. You got a small percentage there, 2.15% is glaciers, and a 0.65% that is groundwater, lakes and rivers, soil moisture and atmosphere. So we also need this. So, so far we got what? Arable land, we got topsoil, we got fresh water supply. All of these things are leading to a concern of what we're going to do if we have a shortage of food over the next 27 years. So now, farming problems, let's look at these. So for those of us that are not farmers, and maybe you didn't grow up on a farm, you're like, okay, why is it such a concern? I don't know any of this stuff. These are the traditional farming problems and why a lot of people are starting to consider vertical farming. So let's look at the problems traditional farmers have. Number one, tillage negatively impacts soil quality, it fractures the soil, disrupts soil structure, accelerates service runoffs, and soil erosion. That's number one. If you're a farmer, you know exactly what we're talking about.
talking about where you have to move them. This leads to the next one. The government pays farmers to limit crop growth to put a price floor in place so farmers can stay in business. Number three, irrigation is highly inefficient. Number four, unpredictable weather. Number five, insects. And it's limited to only portions of the year. Fertilizer dependent on last but not least, chemicals and pesticides. There is a timeline for this. This is why it's not sustainable for us to go this way long term. Now, vertical farming, if you look at it, came about in 1999 when this professor from Columbia University, Dixon Despomier, he's a professor of environmental health sciences and 105 graduate students were exploring methods to address this problem and came up with the concept of vertical farming. A multi-story building grown layers of crops on each floor. Pretty common sense for us to be like, if you and I were th thinking about this, you're like, we probably should have known this 100 years ago. 1999 is when we thought about, what if we go this way, right? Right? kind of cool when you think about it. In fact, if you look at some of these videos that we're showing you, this is called vertical farming. This is what Elon Musk's brother, Kimball, got involved in. So now the benefits of vertical farming, here's what it is. No soil required, which alleviates the topsoil problem, requires 99% less water and fertilizer, can grow year round, no pesticides, occupies 99% less space because you're simply going up, can be placed in cities, cutting the burden of long transportation. So you may say, Pat, who cares about transportation? Here's why. Currently, average distance of farm food transportation is 1,500 miles. 68% of people live in cities far from farms. Fruit and vegetables lose up to 50% of nutrients from farm to store and less carbon emissions from transportation. There you go. That's the benefit because you can put it anywhere. You can literally put it in New York City if you wanted to. You can put it in Miami, in LA, in Beverly Hills, right there, and then boom, deliver it to the people in Beverly Hills. So now, different types of vertical farming. There's three types. Hydroponic. This is where plants grow in water or growing medium with nutrients delivered directly to their roots. Hydroponics is the largest segment and accounted for more than 45% share of vertical farming in 2021. Aeroponics uses a mist to deliver nutrients to plant roots. And then you have aquaponics, which fish are raised and their waste is used as nutrients for crops, creates a loop system where the fish feed the plants and the plants feed the fish. So now you may say, Pat, why are more people doing this? Well, because it's a great idea, it's exciting, but it's expensive. This is is what they haven't yet figured out. So high capital requirement to start. Facilities require a lot of energy. Growing grains like corn and wheat have been a challenge. So now, when you think about this and you're thinking the current method, they're not yet nuclear. They're currently doing it the traditional way. The simulated yields revealed that vertical farming could produce 600 times the current world average wheat yield. In their study, the authors describe how compared with traditional farming methods in outdoor fields, indoor vertical farming also requires less land area, water, herbicides, and pesticides, and result in less nutrient loss to the environment. But there's got to be incentive. So if the capitalist and a job creator are sitting there and there's notice and the margins are like this, you can't really get the big capital into it. But the moment somebody figures out how to do it and not have to use up all the energy, whether they choose to do through nuclear or another form of affordable energy, this could be an industry a lot of people may get involved in in no time, okay? Because the, again, the upside is essentially unlimited because the upside is unlimited, right? So now, some creative ways they can do to maybe cut costs, right? This is the one thing we talked about earlier, what people fear, AI being one of them. This is where AI can actually help solve this problem that they're facing. So number one, using AI, they can cut labor costs. They can operate 24 seven. AI can operate on a cloud connected network, monitor soil health. AI can conduct chemical analysis, machine learning algorithms, use data to optimize the automated system. Drones make it more feasible to monitor high up sections, able to be programmed to move in preset paths around the farms. If they're able to do those types of things, they save a little bit of money. If they can use affordable energy, the rest is history. So let's look at what Elon Musk's brother, Kimball is up to with this company called Square Root. If you look at these containers, you see how they're on top of each other? It's a very interesting model because one of these 320 square foot containers can produce as much as a one to two acre traditional outdoor farm, barely using any water. And by the way, there's so much applications, people wanting one of these uh, containers. There's people right now making $30,000 part-time doing this. They're flooded with applications, but this is one of the companies out there that's doing this. There's a couple out 
there right now. The top vertical farming companies, one of them is AgriCool, uh, revenue of 103 million, that's very small. The other one is Bowery Farming, $83 million. Freight Farms, $72 million. Aero Farms, $22 million. And it's estimated, if you look at this industry, by 2030, this could be a 25 to $26 billion industry. People are just realizing this. So watch this. What I just presented to you, how are you receiving this content? So use your reason, logic, and the level of skepticism. What area are you skeptical about? Think about it. You're like, no, this kind of makes sense. This is logical. So this is where entrepreneurs come in and solve the world's problems through innovation. That's vertical farming. This is why I trust in capitalism because there's incentive to solve many of the problems we're dealing with today. So thoughts, concerns, comment below. If you got value from this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. I did a video four years ago titled How to Disrupt Any Industry. If you've never seen it before, click here to watch it. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye, bye-bye.